Hello, this is lecture two in a series of three on cardiology for MRC-PCH part one, delivered by me, Ian McConaughey. The learning objectives for this lecture are to identify signs and symptoms of heart disease in children, including murmurs and right-to-left shunts, and to consider the following conditions as listed. So to begin with question one, early signs of heart failure in infancy include... Please look at the list provided and take some time to think about your answer. So the answers, as you can see, are that heart failure in infancy is usually due to a large left to right shunt and the signs and symptoms are given there. As mentioned before, it's important to distinguish between peripheral cyanosis and central cyanosis. Central cyanosis being due largely to right to left shunts in congenital heart disease. As mentioned previously, there are other causes of cyanosis which include respiratory and persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Congenital heart disease accounts for about 8 per 1,000 live-born infants. And they can present with a detection of a heart murmur, with cyanosis, with heart failure, with shock, or may have been picked up on routine antenatal ultrasound screening of the fetus. Checking the heart of the fetus is a routine part of the fetal anomaly scan performed in the UK, often between 18 to 20 weeks gestation. Conditions such as hyperplastic heart can be picked up as well as other large structural defects. This has had an effect on the incidence of life-threatening conditions such as hyperplastic heart infants being born, in that instead termination of pregnancy is offered. That is to say that there is a decreasing incidence owing to this antenatal detection. Coming back to the question, it is important, however, to note the signs and symptoms of heart failure, realising that, of course, failure to thrive may be a feature, as well as excessive weight gain, particularly in the neonatal period. Question two. Moving on to a common question. The following are among the three most common acyanotic congenital heart defects. And you'll see a list for you to peruse. The list given in this slide include acyanotic and cyanotic heart conditions. Top of the list for acyanotic heart conditions are VSDs, followed by PDAs, that's to say patent duct arteriosis, pulmonary stenosis, coarctation of the aorta, ASDs, and so on. The cyanotic heart conditions include fallows, that's the tetralogy of fallow, transposition of the great arteries, and total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage, TAPVD. Some of these congenital heart disorders are associated with genetic syndromes, for example, complete ventricular septal defects, as with Down syndrome, with left-sided problems such as coarctation of the aorta with Turner syndrome, and with Marfan syndrome, problems relating predominantly to the annulus, such as aortic regurgitation and aneurysmal formation of the arch of the aorta. You also have to remember that certain teracogens are also associated with the development of congenital heart disease, a classic example being that of maternal lithium ingestion, giving rise to Epstein's anomaly, that is to say, right atrialization of the right ventricle, i.e. the tricuspid valve being set low down into the right ventricle and impeding outflow from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk. Question 3. An eight-year-old boy is referred with pain in his legs when walking. Musculoskeletal and neurologic examination is unremarkable. The blood pressure in his right arm is 160 on 90 millimetres of mercury. 
His femoral pulse is a present, but slightly difficult to feel. On auscultation, you find an ejection click at the base of the heart, accompanied by an ejection systolic murmur heard loudest at the right upper sternal edge, but also at the mid-left sternal edge and through to the back. His ECG shows left ventricular hypertrophy, but his chest X-rays are reported as normal. What is the most likely diagnosis? Coarctation of the aorta, if critical, can present with heart failure in the early period of infancy. This is because the obstruction to outflow of blood from the left ventricle is extensive, giving rise to left ventricular hypertrophy, back pressure up to the left atrium, and then to the lung. The decreased blood flow to the rest of the body beyond the obstruction means that there's poor peripheral perfusion and the development of lactic acidosis. This may be characterised by relatively poor renal output, that is to say, oliguria or anuria. The femoral pulses in this situation will be difficult or absent. In this situation, the child may present appearing to be cyanosed owing to the associated lactic acidosis, poor peripheral perfusion. It is not, however, central cyanosis due to the heart condition itself. If the situation is that there is not critical obstruction, there will nonetheless be poor renal perfusion. In response, there will be increased secretion of aldosterone and angiotensin. This means that the child may present with hypertension in the upper part of the body proximal to the obstruction. Indeed, in infancy, coarctation of the aorta is one of the commonest causes of hypertension. In order for the rest of the body to be perfused, blood will find its way to the rest of the body beyond the obstruction by way of collaterals and these include the internal mammary arteries and the intercostal vessels. Long-standing obstruction as mentioned before will give rise to a picture of left ventricular hypertrophy and this can be picked up by ECG and on chest x-ray there may be relative enlargement of the left ventricle. Rib notching is seen as a consequence of the collaterals being distended, taking blood to the rest of the body. This means that over time, as the ribs change from being cartilaginous to becoming bony and ossified, the ribs will grow around the distended vessels, hence giving the appearance of rib notching. Question 4. A three-month-old boy presents with poor weight gain and sweating on feeding. On examination, he's tachyneic at rest, with peripheral oxygen saturations of 93% in air. He has downward slanting palpable fissures, a protruding tongue, and bilateral single palmar creases. On auscultation, there is a harsh pan-systolic murmur, loudest at the lower left sternal edge. Chest X-ray shows cardiomegaly with increased pulmonary vascular marking. An ECG shows a superior axis. What is the most likely diagnosis? The physical features described are compatible with Down syndrome. That is to say, single palmar creases, palpable fissures, and the protruding tongue. The other features described are consistent with congestive heart failure and may go with a VSD or a partial or complete AVSD. The trick in this question is about the orientation of the ECG, the so-called superior QRS axis. This is also called left axis deviation. This occurs because there's a defect where the atrioventricular node normally is. The downward displaced node then conducts to the ventricles superiorly 
giving the abnormal ECG axis. Characteristic features also in the chest X-ray are that there's cardiomegaly in large pulmonary arteries and increased pulmonary vascular markings, which would be typical with an ABSD or a VSD, but the ECG is definitive in this situation. As mentioned previously, heart conditions are commonly associated with genetic chromosomal abnormalities. In Downs, there being a high incidence of cardiac defects, in particular AVSDs. Other conditions associated with heart disease include Edwards syndrome, that's to say trisomy 18, which may have complex cardiac and life-threatening anomalies, as with Patau syndrome, trisomy 13. Chromosome 22q11-2 deletion is associated with aortic arch abnormalities and phallus tautology. Williams syndrome, chromosome 7 microdeletion, is associated with supravalvular aortic stenosis and peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. Moving on to question 5. Which of the following are true regarding ventricular septal defects? Ventricular septal defects are common, not only in life, but also in the exam, and therefore you must be fully cognizant with the features. We've talked previously about small and large VSDs, and just to remind you that the symptoms in large VSDs include heart failure with breathlessness and failure to thrive, though there may also be in the neonatal period an excessive amount of weight gain and recurrent chest infections. The physical signs are an active precordium, a soft pan-systolic murmur or no murmur if the shunt is large without turbulent flow, an apical mid-diastolic murmur owing to increased flow across the mitral valve, a loud P2 owing to raised pulmonary arterial diastolic pressure, and the features of tachycardia tachycardia, and hepatomegaly associated with heart failure. ECG changes may be showing biventricular hypertrophy by about two months of age and thereafter signs of pulmonary hypertension and even the evolution of Eisenmenger syndrome. The evolution of Eisenmenger syndrome is not predictable. Chest X-ray will show cardiomegaly in large pulmonary arteries, increased pulmonary vascular markings and even pulmonary edema. Treatment initially may be medical with diuretics often combined with captopril. Dietitian input is essential as the increased basal metabolic rate is up in this condition, as with other congenital heart disorders. Depending on the type, i.e. small or large, and its location, surgery may be necessary. As I indicated before, muscular VSDs, that is to say those in the interventricular septum going down towards the apex of the heart are much more likely to spontaneously close than are those located in the membranous area. As previously discussed, VSDs which close within the membranous area may cause anatomical distortion. Surgery is usually performed at three to six months of age in order to manage cases where medical management is not managing to deal adequately with the child's symptoms and signs, and also to prevent lung damage arising from pulmonary hypertension and high blood flow. Moving on to question six. Which of the following are common features of persistent ductus arteriosus? I'll leave you to make your mind up. The ductus arteriosus in utero allows blood to shunt from the right ventricle across the main pulmonary trunk directly to the aorta. Only about 10 to 15 percent of the output of the right ventricle goes to the lung. The majority goes to the aorta. This is because 
the fetus doesn't breathe, and therefore there isn't a great need for a large amount of circulation to the pulmonary vascular bed. After delivery, the increased level of oxygen means that the pulmonary vascular bed dilates and there is greater divergence of blood flow to this area. The increased oxygen level has an effect of functionally closing the duct as well. In premature children, a significant number will maintain a patent ductus arteriosus. And it's very common to see on a neonatal unit children who require indomethacin, fluid restriction and other treatments in order to wean them off their ventilation owing to shunting from the aorta to the pulmonary bed. Examining the peripheral pulses will give the characteristic bounding pulse. This is, this is to say that the left ventricle pumps out blood, reaches the arch of the aorta, and then a significant amount moves off into, via the PDA, the pulmonary circulation. This blood that's gone to the pulmonary vascular circulation then comes back to the left atrium and the left ventricle, so distending the left ventricle. This can give rise to left ventricular hypertrophy, and hence the force of ejection out from the left ventricle is increased. This is transmitted by the sharp upward stroke felt on the pulse and the so-called runoff, that's to say the blood moving from the arch of the aorta to the pulmonary vascular bed, means that there's less blood actually coming to the peripheral artery being palpated than might be expected, i.e. there's a sharp decrease in the waveform as when it is felt by you as the examiner. Hence the term bounding pulse. Moving on to question seven. Fallows. Fallows is a well-beloved question in the exam. And just to remind you, comprises four elements. That is to say, VSD, overriding arch of the aorta, right ventricular hypertrophy, and one of the most important elements, pulmonary infundibular hypertrophy, which may go into spasm, causing a so-called spelling episode or TET episode. As there is a VSD and turbulent flow, the endothelial surface may become disturbed and as noted in Lecture 1, any such eroded area may be a focus for colonisation by bacteria. As there is a VSD, and particularly when pulmonary infundibular spasm occurs, shunting from right to left. This means that any septic collections can be moved into the left atrium and up and out into the aortic arch and therefore can lead to brain abscess formation. Similarly, strokes are also seen as well as infective endocarditis. Within the feature of fallows, is the, commonly seen as the development of polycythemia, which may also contribute to sludging within the cerebral circulation and stroke formation. Arrhythmias are often associated with sudden death, and again this may relate to the development of pulmonary infundibular spasms. I will talk more about spelling episodes in Lecture 3. Question 8. In a five-year-old child, a heart murmur is likely to be due to an underlying cardiac structural lesion if... Have a look at the following options. Innocent murmurs. Innocent murmurs, as stated, are positional... That's to say they vary between lying a patient down or asking them to stand up. They're not ever diastolic. They can be heard in the neck. They're often soft and quiet. A harsh murmur is unusual. Pathological murmurs are invariably associated with other 
signs of cardiac disease. Question 9. These are a series of questions where you are given a choice of different management strategies and there are three accompanying scenarios. Each option may be used once, more than once, or not at all. So, the first scenario is as given. The answer is B. This child has many of the features of Kawasaki's disease. This disease affects predominantly children aged between six months up to four years. It can less commonly occur in older children. The most important aspect from a cardiac point of view is the development of giant cardiac aneurysms. And indeed, Kawasaki's disease is one of the commonest causes of acquired congenital heart disease in childhood. Echocardiography may show a pericardial effusion, myocardial disease, as evidenced by poor contractility. There may be endocardial disease with valve regurgitation or, as I've mentioned, giant aneurysmal formation. That is to say, there's greater than 8 millimeter aneurysm formation. If the coronary Arteries are abnormal, angiography or MRI, and immediate referral to a cardiac expert is required. There are Cochrane searches that have shown that immunoglobulin use and IVIG form part of the management of this condition. Turning to question 9b. The answer, in this case, is D. This child seems to be presenting with infective endocarditis. All children at any age with congenital heart disease are at risk of infective endocarditis. This is also true if there's any prosthetic material in situ, such as a replacement valve, or the use of any grafting material, such as a Gore-Tex graft, which can act as a foreign body can be a difficult diagnosis, but should be thought about in any child or adult who has a raised fever, lethargy, unexplained anemia hematuria. The clinical signs, therefore, may be of apraxia of unknown origin or prolonged fever, pallor, anemia, lassitude, splinter hemorrhages, and splenomegaly. Hematuria, which may be microscopic, can be present, as well as arthritis, arthralgia, and very rarely retinal infarcts or neurological signs from cerebral infarction. A high index of suspicion has therefore got to be considered for this diagnosis. And again, cardiological expert help is required. Question C. The answer in this case is C. This is a presentation of rheumatic fever and it's essential that you're familiar with the Duckett-Jones criteria. This will be dealt with in detail in the next lecture. So in summary, in lecture two we have dealt with the signs and symptoms of heart failure, considered asynotic conditions and the genetic predisposition towards congenital heart disease in general. We've looked at co-artation of the aorta, the left to right shunts, AVSD, VSD, PDA, looked at fallows, thought about how to distinguish innocent murmurs from pathological murmurs, and finally looked at Kawasaki disease, infective endocarditis, and rheumatic fever scenarios. Thank you for listening.